come and uh, present the message of the hour and I have a couple of other things I need to share with you as well. So, Rick, we're glad to have you. We'll turn things over to you. Now, Roger, I thought you said I could have the whole sermon go right ahead. because I see it says here, um, my topic tonight is heathen witch doctors. We're from Kentucky, and uh, you read the, I'm just checking to see if you read the bulletin this morning. <laughs> Not really. I, <laughs> we don't have any heathen witch doctors there yet. yet. But, uh, no, my wife and I, we live in Bowling Green, Kentucky. We're not home much. We travel a lot for World Bible School around the country, uh, sharing the great news about World Bible School. Uh, those of you that don't know that much about World Bible School, it's, it's a ministry of the Churches of Christ. We, it was started by Jimmy Lovell, who grew up in Portland, Tennessee. And back in 1973, he was working on correspondence courses, mainly in third world countries. And from his experience, it, it just grew and blossomed so big that he couldn't handle it all. So he started World Bible School so he could get more and more congregations involved. And through the last uh, 40 plus years, over 30 million individuals in all 200 countries have had an opportunity to start a study on God's word through World Bible School. And uh, it's really a unique uh, uh, work. Matter of fact, it was uh, back in 1977 when I was at preaching school, uh, we had the opportunity to travel to Africa and we, we got over there a bunch of us young preachers and uh, we were uh, preaching, we had over 100 baptisms, and we thought we were doing a great work. And then we realized that we hadn't done anything, that all the seeing of, uh, sowing of the seed had been done by Christians here in America through World Bible School. And all we were doing is we were doing the follow-up and the baptizing. Uh, through the years, so many have come to the point of understanding who Jesus is through that uh, correspondence course program. Matter of fact, this last year we had over a million and a half students sign up and to study the Bible, and from that over 18,000 obeyed the gospel. And our cost is $1 per student. For every dollar that's given to World Bible School, it's possible for one student to start their study. And right now we're signing up one new student on an average every 30 seconds. So every 30 seconds there's another new student signing up somewhere in the world. One of the unique things with World Bible School, and I'll close with this thought, is uh, it, it was started, like I said, mainly a third world work, but the work has expanded so much here in America because of the internet. Uh, when I grew up, it was using Jewel Miller film strips, cottage meetings, and have people come over, show the films, and then they would learn about Jesus. But today's world, everybody, it seems like, now has smartphones and iPads and, and laptops, and so we put together a program, put a lot of work and money into this program, and it's called Connect, where we can go out and literally go into computers around the United States, and individuals can study the Bible in the privacy of their own home. And we have this little student recruitment card, and I'm going to leave this with you all if you ever want to make some. Uh, it doesn't cost that much to take it to your printer, have them printed up. And when you see someone, a relative, a friend, a neighbor, and you're talking to them about the church here, Say, we have this Bible study, it's free, it's on the internet, and we'd like you to just kind of look at it and see if you like it. And what happens, they'll get on there and study, and it's very comprehensive, and when they go through it, they learn about Jesus, and that's what it's all about. We're trying to sow the seed. You know, Paul said, I sow the seed, Apollos waters, but who brings the increase? God does. The power of God's word. And so uh, think about that, and thank you for all your support. In the last two years, you made it possible for 2,000 uh, students around the world to start their Bible study. And from that, 20-plus students came to the point of obeying the gospel. And uh, you made that possible. 20 new souls have been brought to Jesus because of your contributions. Thank you. We appreciate Rick being with us and his wife tonight, and uh, I've been familiar with this work uh, since its inception uh, back in 1973. That tells you that I am getting old, not old yet, but I'm getting there. And uh, in fact, there was a time when Diane and I were doing uh, World Bible School studies uh, with folks in Africa, but as my work grew and uh, other things uh, compelled my time, I had to find uh, 
a way to get everything done in relationship to my work uh, here and elsewhere and uh, had to give up that. Uh, but for those of you in the audience tonight who would like to teach the gospel, this is an excellent way to do it. For those of you who would like to support the teaching of the gospel, this is an excellent work to be involved in. Rick called me just a little over a week ago, I guess it was, not quite two weeks ago, and asked for five minutes. Now, you could have had the entire period, but we need a little more uh, lead way. I tend to be rather regimented. The sermons are scheduled uh, at least three, sometimes six months in advance. And uh, so if you want to come back, uh, give us a little time and we can make room for you. And if you don't want to come back, don't tell us that would hurt our feelings. Next Sunday... God willing, I will be with the church in Spencer, West Virginia. Harry will be speaking at both our morning and evening assemblies next week. Kurt will be teaching our Sunday morning Bible class, and Tim will be teaching our Wednesday evening class a week from this Wednesday. These fellows always do a wonderful job, and I know that will be the case again in my absence uh, next week. I'm looking forward to that meeting and looking forward to concluding it so I can be back with you uh, the following Lord's Day. I must tell you that I enjoy being with brethren in other places, but there is no place like home, and this is home. And when I am not here, I tell you honestly, my heart remains with you, but I know that things are well and that uh, you function just fine in my absence. Perhaps some of you might say you function better in my absence, and that would actually be a good thing as well, because as I pointed out this morning, it's not about me, it's not about any of us, it's about our Lord. We preach Christ and Him crucified. Uh, the message is built around our faith in God and the deity of Christ and the inspiration of the Bible. And as long as we keep our feet firmly planted on that foundation, uh, we will remain the church that God calls us to be. As I was coming in tonight, Kathy mentioned to me that we're going to have about 30 young people with us two weeks from tonight. And we're going to be providing food uh, for them. I think uh, Paul Jacoby has requested some help with that following our evening assembly. I really haven't had a chance to talk to Morning assembly. Well, boy, things get translated when I'm not listening uh, incorrectly. I wasn't really listening that carefully to Kathy. She just said something about food, and I said, I'm sure it'll be fine. So it will be on Sunday morning following our morning assembly, 18, what's that, the 20-something, uh, 25th. Thank you, Tim. So if you're asked to help, I, I know that you will graciously do that because you always have in the past and always will have that confidence in you. We're going to look at uh, the story of Nehemiah briefly tonight. Uh, try to learn some lessons about leadership from this man's ministry. I want to give you some background and then talk about him personally, uh, the obstacles that were in his path, and then the keys to his success. He was the son of Hakaliah. And he served as cupbearer to Artaxerxes in the Medo-Persian Empire. For those of you who are with us on Sunday mornings in our Bible study of world geography and modern events, you know that Persia, ancient Persia, is modern Iran. And that there is a section of scripture where Israel interacts with the per Persian or Medo-Persian Empire. And in fact, it was Cyrus who decreed that the Israelites who had been taken captivity uh, into captivity in Babylon were able to return to Jerusalem, rebuild their temple, the story of Ezra and Zerubbabel. And later, under this Persian king, Nehemiah was able to return and through his efforts, rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. He learned from his brother, Hanani, of the deplorable state of affairs in Jerusalem. And it moved him to tears. 
He learned that things were just simply in turmoil. The city had been destroyed and little effort has been made to restore its walls and uh, regain its safety. And he had tremendous longings to uh, return and do something about it that actually impacted the way he interacted with others. He appeared before the king in his duties as cupbearer and the king immediately recognized that something wasn't right. Do you have that kind of relationship with people that you know them so well that when something's not right you can just interact briefly and realize there's a problem that needs to be addressed? You ask, what's wrong? Why don't you act the way you're normally uh, going to act around me? I know something's weighing heavily on your heart. Tell me, maybe I can help. And that's the kind of thing that happened when Nehemiah came before the king. So Nehemiah poured out his heart. He told the king what was burdening him. And the king said, you can go back and you can take care of this, but you just got to tell me one thing before you go. When will you come back home? And Nehemiah agreed, they set a time, and he set out for Jerusalem with authority from the king to rebuild the walls and to do it at the king's expense. On the third day after arriving in Jerusalem, he, in the company of a few others, went out and really inspected the situation. He found it to be just as bad as his brother had indicated, but he's undaunted. This is something that needs to be done. It is a work of God. And when God wants something done, God's people can always get it done. Never forget that. Any work that is worth doing by God's people, God's people can accomplish with God's help. On our own, I will tell you, we are often powerless. But if it's His work, We're never on our own. One of the great lessons that we learn in Scripture is found in the promise of Jesus. I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, the Hebrews writer makes reference to that promise and says that being the case, there's nothing that we who are Christians should fear. And therefore we should assert with Paul, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. Surveying the situation, he returned to the people, informed them of his mission, and together they set out to do the work. But, as you can imagine, like all good works, there were those who sought to defeat him. The critics are always there. In fact, if you set out to do something worthwhile and there's not someone or some group of people complaining and criticizing and working against you, it may not be so worthwhile after all. This is how the devil operates. Any worthwhile thing that we undertake, he's going to rise up and raise up others to oppose. We can't let the opposition win out. And Nehemiah certainly was not going to do that in relationship to this work. Now, concerning Nehemiah, we can say the following from the book. He was, first and foremost, a very prayerful man. Learning of the situation in Jerusalem, his immediate response is a response of prayer. Prayer is not the last resort for faithful men and women of God. It is our first resort recourse. Remember Asa the king who was deceased of foot, ultimately died. Can't tell you specifics of his disease, but what I can tell you was his priorities were misplaced. He sought not the Lord, but he turned to his physicians. Now doctors can do wonderful things, and some of the closest people to me in my life have been doctors and still are, but they're just men. Their skills are limited, but God's power is not. And therefore, our first recourse ought always to be on our knees in prayer to God. Nehemiah understood that, and in fact, if you go through Scripture and really catalog great men and women of faith, you will find 
invariably that these are people of prayer. He was also studious. You look at the text and you'll find out that he was fully aware of the law of God and dedicated to doing what it required. Can you imagine how transformative that would be if everybody who professed allegiance to Christ shared a similar commitment to the Word of God? That too would be transformative. But what we have today in the religious world are people, in my judgment, who are sincere and who generally seek to be morally upright, but they base their sincerity and their morality not on a thus saith the Lord, but on how they feel about things, what they think or suppose. I suggest to you that Nehemiah was not such a man, nor will any man or woman of faith be of such a nature that they put how they feel about something above what God has revealed. An excellent example of one who went on feelings rather than listening to the word of God would be Naaman, who thought the prophet will come out and strike his hand over the place and call upon his God. And the prophet didn't even appear. He sent a servant out to say, go down to the river and wash seven times and you'll be fine. And the man got exceedingly angry because it didn't play out the way he thought. You know, when we deal with God's word and God's demands, the time for thinking has ended, the time for action has come. Nehemiah got that, I hope we do. He was also very conscientious in relationship to the work that he set out to do. If we're going to succeed, we have to bring a commitment to the work that we're undertaking and be conscientious in our efforts to accomplish our purpose, as he was. He was also a very persuasive gentleman. He knew what he knew, and he stood and faithfully presented it with courage and conviction. One of the real problems I have today with the church and with individual Christians is the very simple fact that we are more interested in being politically correct than biblically true. We're concerned that we might say something that will upset someone or hurt their feelings or in some manner cause them not to like us. In fact, in two weeks, I'll be delivering a message from this pulpit, God willing, on preaching the truth in love. I never if I know myself, say anything that is intentionally designed to hurt anyone. And yet I know if the truth is proclaimed, people who don't want the truth will be offended by it. That is not my problem, nor is it yours. Our responsibility is to stand courageously and speak with conviction what we know to be the truth of God's word. Even when we know that the people that we're speaking to don't really want to hear it. It doesn't make it any less true. And it doesn't lessen our responsibility to preach the word. And to speak as the oracles of God. 2 Peter 4, 1 and 2. 1 Peter 4, verse 11. Nehemiah spoke with conviction. And as a result was very persuasive. He was also a morally an ethically upright man. One of the interesting things about Nehemiah is that he was in a position of leadership and power that could have been very lucrative. But it wasn't for him because he chose not to take advantage of that position and profit from it. Does that sound like people in positions of leadership in modern America today? Go back in the history of this nation and look at some of the figures who stand out. George Washington, as you know, served as the commanding general of the Revolutionary Army. He did it for expenses only. He served as our first president without salary because he saw the responsibility as one that he was compelled to meet. It wasn't about what he could get, but what he could give. Nehemiah was such a man. 
in his day. And how we need men and women today who rise to positions of leadership, not for what they can get from it, but for what they can contribute to society and to the nation. As this great servant of God, he was not without opposition. God's people will always face obstacles. There will inevitably be people who will stand and oppose good works throughout all of biblical history. In fact, I would suggest to you throughout all of human civilization, this has been the case. But we can't let the distractors discourage us from the great work God has called us to do. They made silly, crazy accusations. Let's go to the text that introduced our study this evening very quickly and look at what Sanballat and Tobiah, leaders in this opposition, had to say. They raised this question. What are these feeble Jews doing? Why, they're weak and incapable of accomplishing anything worthwhile. Will they restore it themselves, that is, the walls of the city? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? They'll, they'll work a little bit and get discouraged, and sadly, sometimes that happens. You know, it's easy to get discouraged, to start something really positive and worthwhile, and it doesn't make the progress that you think it ought to make as quickly, and so what do you do? Rather than hang in there and persevere, you kind of back away and give up. A whole lot of good stuff would never get done if men and women of God had that kind of attitude. Nehemiah certainly did not. He knew this was not going to be easy, and he wasn't going to let the detractors discourage him. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah, the Ammonite, was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox go up on it, it will break down their stone wall. Oh, these guys, they don't know what they're doing. A little old fox will walk up on it and it will crumble. Did he really believe that? I seriously doubt it. doesn't have to be true to sow seeds of doubt in the hearts of people and discourage them from the great works they're undertaking. This is but an illustration of it. They made their accusations, but Nehemiah would not be moved by them. You see, what they did was to deny the impossibility of the task. Have you ever had something the church was set out to do and hear somebody stand up and say, well, we can't do that. That's too big a job. That requires too much of us. It's not possible. Is that biblical? I thought all things were possible with God and those who stand with God. Again, isn't that the assertion of Philippians 4.13? When Jesus left this world to return to the throne of God in heaven, Acts chapter 1, he ascended from the mount into the heavens, never to return until the end. And he is returning, not to this earth, but in the air, in the clouds. And we'll meet him there and forever be with him. When he made that ascension, how many disciples are in Jerusalem? You go back and read Acts 1, 120 approximately. In one generation, from that small nucleus, Paul was able to write to the Colossian church in Colossians 1, 6 and 1, 23, with the gospel gone into the world. They did it without radio, television, newspaper, even without World Bible School. Look what we ought to be able to do with everything that is at our disposal. And we ought to be using all of these things as tools and not get discouraged. We're too small in number and the work is too big. If it's God's work, the task is never impossible. The naysayers may deny it, but it doesn't make it true. They belittle the credibility of those involved. Do you know what they say? I, I think I may have mentioned this this morning about those of us who are believers, committed to Christ and to his cause and to the scriptures as the infallible word of our creator. We're ignorant. We're uneducated. 
We're weak-minded. We need a crutch. Oh, my friend, don't let anyone convince you of that. Our faith rests on an unshakable foundation of truth. Truth that we can know. And we can know that we know, which will set us free. When I speak of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, or the inspiration of the Bible, I'm not talking about things that are possibilities that I personally believe. I'm talking to you about the realities, the undeniable realities by folks who will look at the evidence carefully and draw the right conclusions. The real fools in this world, folks, are not believers. They're deniers. Don't take my word for it. Listen to the psalmist. In Psalm 14.1 and in Psalm 53.1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We were watching a television, a British television show last night on Netflix, and the lead character mentioned Pascal's wager. I said, well, I've heard you mention that before. Pascal was a French mathematician and philosopher who said, I can't know for sure whether there is a God or there isn't, but speaking mathematically, as a believer, you cannot lose. As an unbeliever, you cannot win. So common sense dictates that we be believers. I go far beyond Pascal, and I will tell you unequivocally that the evidence sustains our faith. Don't let people try to destroy it by questioning the credibility of what we believe or why we believe it. In fact, 1 Peter 3.15 says that we need to be prepared, ready to give an answer to every man that asks a reason of the hope that is in us, and we should do that with meekness and fear or reverence, respect. Stand for the truth. Do it kindly, but do it. And don't let the critics have sway over your heart. They ridiculed their faith. Who do you think these Jews, these feeble Jews are? Let me tell you, the most powerful force at work in the world today is the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because we have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And it is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1, 16 and 17. They questioned their commitment. But they were committed. Are we? Paul asserted on one occasion, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Do you make that kind of commitment? You cling to it and God will never disappoint you. He will always be there at your side, in your heart, speaking through his word to give you strength, comfort, and direction that will maintain a commitment that should be unshakable. Do you know that research has indicated that it's not the intellectually gifted that really accomplish the greatest things in life? You may think it would be grand to have an IQ of 170 or to be able to whiz through academic classes with straight A's and little effort. But that's no guarantee of success. In fact, the studies indicate that the successful, the real achievers are just those folks who have tenacity, who give everything they have to a cause and don't give up. We had the opportunity not long ago to uh, tour the Henry Ford Museum and that place up there that I can never remember the name of and uh, to see Edison's workshop and, and all of that. How many failures did Edison have before he discovered a filament that actually would work in an electric light bulb? I once knew that, but I can't remember anymore. Let me tell you, it was a lot, but he never quit. In fact, he never called them failures. He said, now we know one more thing that doesn't work, but there's something that will, and they finally figured it out. That's the tenacity that we need to bring to our faith and our commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, why did they ridicule 
Nehemiah and this work so much? Well, they just didn't like the workers or the work they were doing. They saw them as a threat to their position. Sanballat, Tobiah, and others held sway over the city, had essentially the Jews under their thumb, and they wanted to keep it that way. So they worked against this wonderful work. They were ignorant and didn't believe. I am glossing over this quickly tonight because my hope is that you'll go home and you'll spend some time in this wonderful book, have the background to really read and understand what unfolds and what a great accomplishment it was to rebuild the walls of this city and restore safety to its inhabitants. There was actually no solid objection, reason for their objection. But it didn't keep them from making it. And that's often the case, even within the church. Good works are objected to because, well, we've never done it that way before. Well, folks, if it's a work God wants done, and we are free to choose the method in which to accomplish it, that's a silly objection that ought to be quickly overruled because God's work's too important to let objections groundless objections keep us from our goal of taking the gospel to the world. There are really two enemies involved in this effort to undermine Nehemiah and the work. There's the enemy from without, the armed opposition, the Samaritans, the Arabians, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites. They were of such a mindset that they did not want to see success Nehemiah needed to fail for them to maintain their position of authority. They formed a conspiracy, chapter 4, verse 8 says, they conspired against us. Let me stop for a moment and say something to you about the local congregation. It has no real impact on us at this time. But if there is something that you have questions about, if there's something you don't think is being done correctly or something that needs to be improved, just come to the forefront. Speak to the elders. Let them know what you are thinking and why from Scripture and allow them the opportunity to address the issue. You know what generally happens? People get a little bent out of shape and they start talking behind people's back and trying to elicit others on their side till they can essentially raise an, a, a rebellion within the congregation. That inevitably leads to serious problems that shouldn't happen if we handled things correctly. Let's not be conspirators. Remember, every church that I have ever been a part of with elders had men that genuinely wanted to do what's right who cared for the flock they were not perfect they still aren't give them the benefit of the doubt go to them speak with them give them the opportunity to address your questions to deal with the issues and to find a biblical solution. Again, please know, to my knowledge, we're not having any of these issues right now, but they happen in every church from time to time. They wouldn't happen if we handled things correctly. Remember, these are the enemies who are conspiring. They were also wily and ruthless. They shall not know, they say, nor see, till we come in their midst and slay them that their cause might cease. The devil has a way of raising his ugly head at the most inopportune time to thwart good works before they really get off the ground. But there was not only the external enemy, there was the internal enemy as well, the enemy of self-doubt, weariness and discouragement described in chapter 4, verse 10, their strength decayed. They're not able to build the wall. It was a tremendous task, and big task call for big men and women who realize there will be setbacks. I cannot think of any really worthwhile endeavor that 
automatically happens when people put their minds to it and work. There are inevitably going to be setbacks. That's even true in relationship to the Lord's work. There was the constant pressure to surrender as described in chapter 4, verse 12. They said unto us ten times, they will be upon you. They had committed the enemies of Nehemiah and Israel to destroy this work, to literally attack with weapons of war. And others were saying, we've got to be careful. Perhaps we should hold back. They'll attack and we'll be defeated. Well, if it were just a matter of men, that quite possibly would be the case. But remember, this was a work of God. And I care not how many forces the enemies of God may muster. God will always be a more than a match for them. That's why Israel conquered the promised land against essentially overwhelming numbers one of you shall chase a hundred ten of you shall chase a thousand they were told they were not better equipped or better trained they had God on their side and that assured their victory folks that's still the case today take that from Nehemiah now Nehemiah's leadership very quickly see the big penguins in the lead that's Nehemiah don't let that make you sick, by the way. Somebody told me they don't like these kinds of illustrations because they affect them. Close your eyes if they bother you. And I didn't even know it did that until I, I set it up. To <laughs> these things are crazy sometimes. Here's Nehemiah. He has strong reliance upon God. Our God, he said, will fight for us. In essence, is he not saying, it's not because I'm so great, it's because my faith is in the great God that this job will get done. The people had a willingness to work. Worthwhile endeavors require effort. We're urged to fight as Christians. Fight of faith. We're called to earnestly contend. We're called to sacrifice, to give our bodies as living sacrifices. 1 Timothy 6, 12, Jude 3, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And that's going to take a lot from us. And as I have said so often from this pulpit, when given the opportunity to work, don't make excuses. Say yes and serve. Will it make you uncomfortable? Probably. Will it be easy? Probably not. Will it be challenging? Generally, yes. But good work needs to be done. And God's people, as they did in this day, will have a mind to work. He demonstrated dynamic leadership skills. When they learned of the external th threats, what they, did, they brought everybody in and half guarded and half worked. And they kept their weapons at their side. They were prepared for whatever eventuality arose. That's the mark of dynamic leadership. That's Nehemiah. That's our goal. They had a commitment to a cause greater than themselves. Chapter 4, verse 14. The record says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. They were fighting for their very existence. And today we're fighting for our spiritual and eternal salvation and the salvation of others. A cause greater than self. Have an unswerving faith. Chapter 4, verse 20. The record simply says, In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. You enlist in the army of the Lord, the service of the king, to be a member of the church, a part of the family. And serve God faithfully, and I guarantee you, you faithful to him, he'll be faithful to you in every promise he has made. And whatever work he calls us to do can be done. 
when our trust, our faith, our confidence is in him and in his word and not in ourselves. What a wonderful story to read Nehemiah in context and to see what this noble man of God was able to accomplish with God's help and know that the same principles hold true even in our day. In a moment, we'll sing the song that Brad has selected. If you're not a Christian, we plead, we implore you to think about your eternal well-being, your soul salvation, and prepare for the eternity that is to come, the judgment that awaits us all. The very fact that you're here this evening indicates that you have faith. Is it a living or dead faith? A living faith is obedient. A dead faith is not. A living faith saves. A dead faith does nothing. Even the demons believe and tremble. If your faith is alive, it will bring you to repentance, confession, immersion, and yes, faithfulness in the cause of Christ and the work of the King. You'll never regret that. But should you fail to obey, and the king comes, and judgment takes place, and the verdict is rendered, depart, I never knew you, that you will forever regret, and it need not be. We don't ask you to do what we think or feel or believe personally. We just ask you to do what the Bible teaches, what Jesus demands what every child of God must do to be a child of God. And we ask you to be faithful that you might maintain that relationship until he comes to take you home to glory. Won't you do it if you haven't? Young, middle-aged, old, the clock is ticking. Time is running out. This could well be the last opportunity that some of us will ever have to get our lives right with him if they are not. 